people um, turning up, but I think uh, we'll, we'll make a start. Um, so our speaker this morning really needs no introduction, but I shall do my best to introduce her anyway. It's my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Sheila Bird. Uh, Professor Bird is a former programme leader of the MRC Biostatistics Unit at the University of Cambridge, where she has had and continues to have a highly distinguished career into the research of transmissible disease, incorporating everything from hepatitis C, influenza, and of course, COVID-19. On the latter, over the last year or so, she has written and commented extensively on topics, including test and trace, the evaluation of testing in schools, and now casting of cases across the UK. I think we may hear about some of these aspects today. Uh, so without further ado, I shall uh, hand you over to Professor Sheila Bird. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope I can make this work. Uh, in terms of testing times, I'm thinking of tests that one might fail, uh, tests for antigen or antibody, and testing in the sense of evaluation, uh, formal evaluation. So let me start with some declarations of interest, and I'll return to these at the end because they may make a little more sense then. I've served on various working Royal Statistical Society working parties um, in relation to statistics and statisticians in drug regulation and statistical issues in first-in-man studies. Um, I, I've been a medicines commissioner. Um, I've, I've um, been uh, involved in, in an inquiry after uh, the events of BSE and, and variant CJD. But for the purpose of my first example, um, I also served on the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Advisory Committee, uh, that's the Swine Flu Committee, and on the Chief Medical Officers, Ronald, uh, um, uh, Professor Donaldson's Statistical Legacy Group, and that's where my failure comes in. So let me get to that topic first. And the failure was my failure as a medical statistician to have realized before swine flu that the process of death regulation is different in Scotland versus the rest of the United Kingdom. And this difference actually began in, in 1953 with the Births and Deaths Registration Act. Whereas in Scotland, all deaths have to be registered with National Records of Scotland within eight days of death having been ascertained, that does not apply in the rest of the United Kingdom if the death is referred to the coroner for investigation. And of course, coroner's investigations are likely to occur when you have a new epidemic. The problem was concealed in England and Wales uh, from about 2006 because prior to that, the Office for National Statistics had been under pressure uh, because of the untimeliness of its mortality statistics, because it had to allow for late registration of commoners' deaths. So rather than solve the problem, the Office for National Statistics decided that instead it would report uh, deaths by registration week or registration year. Now, of course, this led to confusion because people didn't notice the difference between occurrence year and registration year. And indeed I hadn't either. And so it was only during swine flu that uh, the then president of the Royal Statistical Society, David Hand and I uh, wrote to Sir Liam Donaldson, the chief medical officer, that this was a problem that needed to be solved. And he set up that statistical legacy group, one of the objectives of which one of the, the recommendations was that we needed legislation to end the late registration of deaths in England and Wales. And I have led for the Royal Statistical Society on that topic ever since. Um, we, in 2013, we got a couple of uh, important urgent actions uh, taken ahead of legislation. We petitioned David Cameron as Prime Minister twice. Um, and we hit the buffers really in September 2019 when we conducted a study to see if the so-called personal demographic service uh, date of death 
that is held by NHS Digital might be a good substitute, a good proxy for the formal date of death uh, known eventually to the Office for National Statistics. And unfortunately, the um, personal demographic service date of death is neither sufficiently present, it's present in only 72% of cases, nor was it sufficiently accurate. It agreed with the ONS date of death uh, in only 76% of cases in, in terms of exact agreement. So we'd really run out of options until fortunately the appointment of um, uh, Ian Diamond as the national statistician. And in November 2019, he assured me that he was on the case and he was going to sort this. Unfortunately, of course, as we all know, COVID intervened uh, before he had a chance to do so. So uh, David Cameron, I don't think, thought this was a serious issue at all. What we did achieve was at least that the table legends uh, in Office for National Statistics um, publications make clear the difference between death date and registration, uh, death year and registration year. But even now, the Office for National Statistics has yet to report delay adjusted estimated numbers of weekly deaths by cause, for example, uh, COVID. And we got NHS Digital to explain uh, to those that were paying for record linkage uh, that flagging for mortality gave them access to registered deaths, not to all deaths. And therefore it was necessary that they should also receive, that they should receive both the registration date and the death date so that they would understand for their own cohort the extent to which this problem was affecting them. And it would affect them considerably if they were dealing with premature mortality, those aged five to um, 44 years, because one in five of those deaths is not registered in England and Wales for at least six months. So coming now properly to, to COVID, reporting delays are inevitable. Um, so what we had during the first wave of uh, SARS, um, in the United Kingdom is that hospital deaths after a COVID diagnosis were, uh, that were announced daily were actually the deaths that were reported in in the past 24 hours. They were not deaths that had occurred in the past 24 hours. The difference was disguised by failure uh, to label the time axis as report date versus death date. So if you saw the, the, the number 10 uh, press conferences, you would find it was just re referred to as date, not report date versus death date. Now that fools journalists perhaps at, at number 10, but of course not statisticians, because we expect that the count by death date should drop off in the recent days due to reporting delays. And so that prompted um, uh, uh, Bent Nielsen, who's a professor of econometrics at Oxford, and I to actually put into the public domain now casting of the hospital deaths, and we posted those daily. That's not that other people were not doing this. It was being done by Spy M, the Spy Modeling Group, um, but it wasn't being brought into the public domain. And so plots like this so that um, the, the, by date of death, the uh, most recently reported deaths are of course low. And so because of reporting delays, and so you need now casting to give you an estimate with uncertainty of the number of deaths that actually will have occurred on that day. And um, this now of course is done much more in, in, it's also done in a more sophisticated way, not just now casting, but also forecasting. But partly the, the, uh, what our posting, the, the, the now casting did, was to encourage that this work would come into the public domain. It was being done. And this is, of course, a much more sophisticated version because of the forecasting, and it takes into account a number of sources of information. So passing on from uh, reporting delays, um, this uh, famous phrase by Brian Hannon um, uh, during the Battle of the Falklands, uh, 
I counted them all out and I counted them all back. But did the UK count its tests properly? So initially, as you may remember, during wave one, there was limited access to antigen testing. We were basically told if you are unwell, stay at home and don't bother anyone unless your symptoms worsen after seven days. Now, of course, one of the other reporting problems here was the difference between the date on which the patient uh, provides uh, a, an, an oropharyngeal swab and the date that they get the result of the laboratory test, of the antigen test on that swab. What matters for tracking the epidemic is the swab date, not the delay until you get the result. Uh, the UK was ramping up the access to PCR testing, and that resulted in, polit in politicians setting targets for themselves and the laboratories as to the number of tests that would be done by a certain time, in May, beginning of the end of May. Rem let me remind you um, the, the strange way in which we categorize tests. Pillar one referred to PCR testing for those who are clin in clinical need. These tests were done largely by NHS laboratories and referred primarily to patients who were hospitalized. Now, hospitalized patients require more than one PCR test. Uh, typically, a, you may have an initial test because the doctor suspects that you have COVID. That test may come back negative, but the clinician still thinks this patient has got COVID and they do a repeat test. And then as the patient is recovering, generally two consecutive negative tests were required before the patient would be discharged home. So in pillar one, it was typical for there to be more than one test per patient. And that's a pretty obvious thing if you're a biostatistician. In pillar two testing, that was uh, for healthcare workers, members of the, of the household of healthcare workers, uh, social care workers, members of their household, and even the likes of thee and me. But the data were not collected in a manner in which you could separate those subgroups, which was remiss. And then, I can't remember what pillar three was about, but pillar four um, were the tests that were used for surveillance purposes. And they were a mixture of antigen tests, the have I got it test, and antibody tests, have I had it? Now, so what I've summarized is that the number of tests performed does not equal the number of individuals tested. Even the number of positive tests does not equal the number of positive individuals. And not all tests are alike. And so in order to meet the targets, home PCR tests, the antigen tests uh, were sent to people's home, they were counted out but whether they were delivered, used, submitted to the laboratory and actually analysed was not counted. So uh, a bit of a, a mishmash, to say the least. So let me turn now to the test and trace system. And um, the, this is um, Baroness Dido Harding, who uh, heads up test and trace and has recently appeared before select committees uh, such as the Science and Technology Select Committee, um, where she was asked to prove uh, the extent to which the test and trace system helps to curb the spread of COVID. Now, again, uh, the goal of test and trace really is infection control. And the idea behind it is that if we experience one of four key symptoms, we should book PCR test. But the numbers who book a test are only about a third of those whom the Office for National Statistics Infection Survey or the REACT survey estimates are actually infected. That's partly because probably about a third of infections are asymptomatic, but there is still a shortfall with people apparently who have symptoms and don't seek a test, perhaps because the symptoms are relatively mild. The, those who do seek a test and are PCR positive, so-called index cases, are referred to the test and trace system. The tracer 
then gets in touch with the index case, and that happens for about um, for 86% of the index cases. The index case is, is asked to identify the close contacts, and 78% uh, uh, have been able to do so. Close contacts include members of their own household and um, external contacts with whom they have been in sufficiently close contact uh, recently that infection might have been transmitted. The next step is that the tracer then reaches the attempts to reach the identified close contacts and asks them to self-isolate. And that effort succeeds for about 80% of the identified close contacts. But the proportion of self-isolating contacts who are external contacts is actually very low. It's only one, one essentially one in five. Uh, now, of note, is that uh, unfortunately, you might say, uh, recently and before the variant, we were aware of the variant of concern, uh, which is more transmissible, the UK reduced the quarantine period for external contacts from 14 days to 10 days. And the other aspect of test and trace is that it works essentially by telephone and text. There are no, essentially no home visits involved which is not a traditional approach to infection control. And so there are statistical societies, COVID-19 task force, published a statement on the 23rd, uh, 23rd of July um, on how to glean intelligence about infection control, asymptomatic in, uh, infections, and adherence to self-isolation within test and trace households. I followed up uh, with a letter to Matt Hancock on the 13th of October, and the Lord and Lord Bethel replied to that letter on the 11th of January. So, what was the RSS task force recommending? Well, the first two recommendations were essentially, essentially concerned record linkage. So, the first one the, was to use record linkage between uh, PCR test requests. Uh, against test and traces contacts database. And in that way, you would be able to find out what proportion of identified contacts, be they members of the household of an index case, or be the external contacts, and, and you don't expect the proportion to be the same in the two cases, what proportion of those identified contacts actually took a test during or soon after quarantine, and how many of them tested positive? We have yet to have that information in the public domain. The second um, uh, recommendation was record linkage within test and traces own databases so that you could line up, first of all, the symptom onset date for the index case because transmission risk is reckoned to start from two days before symptom onset in the index case. So you want to line up symptom on onset date in the index case. The, uh, for external contacts, their date of last close contact with that index case. And the third thing to line up is the contacts, external contacts, self-isolation start date. Because what is important in terms of the performance of test and trace is what proportion of the intended self-isolation period for that external contact has actually elapsed before test and treat and test, test and trace reach the contact. And of course, if they're never reached, essentially 100% of the intended self-isolation period has elapsed. Uh, I believe that today test and trace uh, partly in, in, in honour of, of this invitation, well, I'd like to think, um, but I think Test and Trace's report today should include information about linking between symptom onset date and the contacts, contacts self-isolation date. Now, that work was essentially done in September, so, you know, and very good work. And then there was some 
uh, you know, quality control to be done. But it has not taken four months, basically, for that quality control uh, to, to come to fruition. Uh, not so that I think what has happened is there has been a delay in the release of this information. So I hope some of it will be released today. We still won't have number two there. Okay, so those should have been straightforward data science issues quickly into the public domain. The other recommendations by the RSS task force uh, involved uh, actually visiting the households, a random sample of households. So the, the, we wanted there to be random sample of the two types of household, the household of the index case where uh, other members of that household are self-isolating, and secondly, a random sample of the households of external contacts. The objective was to discover the proportion who are PCR positive of those self-isolating people on random visit days, in which you would also elicit symptoms to find out whether they are asymptomatic positives or symptomatic positives. And the recommendation was that the first of two random visits uh, the first visit should be on a random day during the first five days of self-isolation and the second during days six to then 14 days. Um, because we anticipated that the first five days might be missed entirely for external contacts if it took too long to reach them. And the second uh, benefit from that, those random visits so from the same randomly sampled households as above, you would also discover the proportion of the contacts, the two types of households, who were actually self-isolating on the random visit day, because they're not there for you to give them the, uh, the opportunity of a PCR test. Um, it may be only now that the United Kingdom is thinking about adding um, day two and day eight PCRs or D2 and D8, D8 lateral flow tests to the test and trace operation. Uh, I don't think that decision has been taken yet. It could be well be a sensible thing to do. Uh, but in the meantime, we have not gleaned the intelligence that we ought to have done. Instead of which, um, we had uh, a different approach, which was uh, mass asymptomatic serial screening. And this was uh, pioneered in Liverpool uh, with the help of the army. And uh, to the great credit of the academics in Liverpool, they ensured that there was an inbuilt evaluation. So let's have a look at what Liverpool learned about the INOVA lateral flow test. The participation rate in asymptomatic screening for Liverpool, by Liverpool citizens was around 25%, not around 75% as had been the <clears throat> Dom Cummings prior assumption. Participation rate was inversely correlated with prevalence. In, in other words, you had a participation rate of about 10% in 10, 15% in wards that had a higher prevalence. Uh, what the Liverpool academics did was ensure that uh, around 6,000 citizens who were willing uh, were dual swabbed so that one of the swabs was used for the lateral flow test, the other for PCR testing. Now, of those 6,000 citizens, 70 were PCR positive, but only 28 of the 70 were positive on the lateral flow test. In other words, the detection rate by the lateral flow test uh, was only 40% of the PCR positives. Now, in fact, those PCR positives that had a low uh, CT value, the, 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 the CT value refers to cycle threshold because in the PCR test, you are amplifying uh, the, the RNA uh, to see if you can detect positivity. And the fewer cycles of amplification you need, uh, 
the higher the viral load is the underlying theory. So two thirds of, of the PCRs uh, with a low uh, cycle threshold um, were picked up by the lateral flow test. So the story has evolved and now lateral flow test is described as being a test for infectiousness. There are many ifs and buts along the way of that story. And Liverpool has not yet, I think, reported the proportion of those who attended for a first screen who returned for their second screen within a week. The, the serial uh, rapidly got dropped because citizens who might be interested to have a single test weren't particularly interested to keep going and having an oral pharyngeal swap. And then we had the use of this uh, inner lateral flow test uh, across the United Kingdom. University students were asked to take two tests to enable their return home for Christmas. Now, what was perhaps surprising was the low number of lateral flow positives per 10,000 students. Also surprising, given the number of universities we have in the United Kingdom, is that, as far as I'm aware, only a single university uh, did an in-context evaluation of that lateral of the lateral flow test, and that was Birmingham, where Professor John Deeks is. Um, the the reports from the Scottish universities include the fact that they could not rely upon the lateral flow test batch that had been used at Dundee University. They discovered that because so many, they had such a large number of positives as to be incredible. So then the third place where there have been these moonshot screenings is in secondary school, school pupils, um, where the idea was that, for example, on a Monday morning, the pupils would take a lateral flow test and lateral flow testing would be twice weekly for teachers. There was no inbuilt evaluation here. There was only PCR um, confirmation of the lateral flow positives, not any estimation of the PCR positives that were missed by lateral flow testing. So the, lat the use of lateral flow tests has moved on again and the um, current consideration is that instead of pupils who are contacts of uh, somebody who has tested positive um, uh, in a PCR test, if instead of those pupils having to self-isolate and miss school, an alternative might be to offer them daily, those contacts to offer them daily lateral flow testing. Now, when you consider that test and traces infection control has force of law, in other words, we are supposed to self-isolate. Oh, excuse me, my phone. I do apologize. Um, I'll try a bucket of water for the phone the next time. <laughs> so let me let me backtrack here. <sighs> I'm sorry, I'm giving a lecture just now. Bye. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Sorry, I rather suspect that that was, a phone, that was a phone call from the Headland Surgery, and I suspect it's asking me to go for, for my vaccination. So I shall phone them later. <laughs> so back to the next step. So as, as you're aware, the infection control aspect of test and trace has force of law. If you're asked to self-isolate, that's what you're supposed to do. So um, a way out of that for uh, secondary school pupils um, would be to evaluate this a formal evaluation whether uh, seven 
days of lateral flow testing um, could be an alternative to the pupil um, having to uh, self-isolate at home for seven for 10 days. But then you have to ask questions as to whose consent. You need the consent of the school, the school governors, the individual pupil, the family of that pupil. Uh, children, by definition, are vulnerable, and so you need the approval of a medical research ethics committee, and you probably need DMEC, because if this is not a good idea, which it may not be, then you could increase transmission in the school. So you end up thinking in terms of a formal evaluation with school effectively being a cluster and a randomized controlled trial, the principal outcome perhaps being the COVID related um, uh, attendance days lost. Uh, as I said, the intervention is that school-based close contacts have the option of a lateral flow test for seven days um, at school, uh, uh, during school days, but then have to do lateral flow tests at home at the weekends. Um, but in order to have the inbuilt evaluation, the pupils would also have to be asked to give a daily second swab each day uh, for PCR testing. Uh, but you would delay the, the analysis of those swabs because they were for, for a research evaluation. Uh, all of that has ethical connotations. Um, and if the, the pupil tested self, um, uh, positive on the lateral flu test, then they would uh, go into self-isolation. Whereas in the control schools, uh, those school-based close contacts would be asked to self-isolate at home for 10 days, which is the force of law. Um, and the school, but the school would arrange for home-based PCR testing on, for example, day two and day seven of the self-isolation. That is over and above what happens for most of us uh, uh, during a period of self-isolation and would need research um, consent. It is important that any such evaluations have open protocol as you would expect for any uh, study that has MREC approval. Last topic I want to discuss briefly is the uh, delayed second dose of the world's first ever um, messenger RNA vaccine, the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech COVID vaccine. So here in this table, I show the results from the randomized controlled trials of the Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna vaccines, both of which are messenger RNA. Um, so those are the, the, the top two panels, and then also the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which is differently principled. It's a virus vector DNA vaccine, and that virus vector has been used previously in the Ebola epidemic, so there is precedent. So uh, the vaccine uh, efficacy of the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, in terms of COVID cases seven or more days after the second dose, 95% uh, reduction in the vaccine group versus the placebo group and almost 40,000 uh, um, participants studied. 26% of the participants in, in the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech trial were aged 65 years plus. The Moderna study um, where the also uh, a messenger RNA vaccine. The schedule for the Moderna was first dose followed 28 days later by the second dose. Pfizer-BioNTech was first dose followed 21 days later by um, the second dose. The Moderna trial, roughly 30,000 people and similarly COVID cases 14 plus days after the second dose, 94% uh, vaccine efficacy. And again, 25% of the participants in the Moderna trial were 65 years of age or older. Uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, trials, where we 
I'm, I'm showing here just the data for standard dose, standard dose, because that's the dose, the dosing that is licensed in the United Kingdom. And the second dose can be given any time between four and 12 weeks after the first dose. Um, the principal outcome here is symptomatic COVID more than 14 days after the second dose. Um, and the vaccine efficacy 63% with a 95% confidence interval from 52% to 72%. They also report the number of COVID cases 22 to 90 days after a single uh, standard dose. But it's not clear what the denominator is there. It should be higher than the denominator in the row above. Uh, and apparently 76% uh, vaccine efficacy, 59% to 86%. So that's the story. Um, going back to the Pfizer-BioNTech, after the first dose and before the second dose, uh, vaccine effectiveness was 52%, with a range from 29% to 68%, because it takes um, about two weeks for the immune system to respond to the first dose. Um, and so what the United King, what Public Health England did was dissect out uh, the period uh, from the first dose to just before the second dose to look separately at 15 days to, to 20, 21 days and found in the Pfizer-BioNTech data that in that short period prior to the second dose, vaccine efficacy was 89%, again, with a wide confidence interval. And there has then been an extrapolation that that would be the same even if you delayed the second dose. That is a big leap for a messenger RNA vaccine. And so, what we had in the United Kingdom was that on Hogmanay, uh, when I should have been in Scotland, but wasn't, um, the chief medical officer, the four chief medical officers in the United Kingdom advised delaying the second dose of the messenger RNA vaccine to 12 weeks maximum. Uh, also, uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca to 12 weeks maximum, but there was precedent for that in the Ebola and 12 weeks was part of the authorized, the, the, uh, authorized uh, dosing interval anyway. So let's look at what happened for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. A bit perplexingly, uh, which was ruled out uh, from the 8th of December, in, in that first week, although we know the numbers uh, of first doses administered in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, the number of first doses has not been reported for England. Um, so I have estimated them pro rata with Northern Ireland um, because England and Northern Ireland have similar numbers pro rata in the second week. And then if I total up all of the first doses with that imputation uh, for the first week for England, all, all those first doses administered before the 4th of January were Pfizer-BioNTech because the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine did not roll out until uh, the 4th of January. So, uh, and also, if you received a second dose uh, before the uh, 25th of January, that second dose must have been uh, Pfizer-BioNTech because the minimum dosing interval for the AstraZeneca, Oxford AstraZeneca, is four weeks. So what transpired is that it would appear that in England, uh, exercise of clinical discretion was such that just over a third of those who received uh, a messenger RNA first dose received their second dose. In Northern Ireland, it was 56% of those who received their first Pfizer-BioNTech dose had received their second dose. Whereas in Scotland and Wales, um, obedience 
to the chief medical officer's advice uh, was rather strict, uh, with only 6% in Scotland receiving their second dose and only 1% in Wales. Looking at England, if instead of clinical discretion or medical disobedience being the reason that over 4,000, about a third of those who had received the first dose, received their second dose on the original schedule of 122 days, then we would already know whether there was a detriment by delaying the second dose of the messenger RNA vaccine. So what I um, uh, had suggested in a letter to Matt Hancock and Lord Bethel on the 13th of January uh, was that we should employ tilted randomization so that at the time of writing that letter, I'd suggested one, uh, a one to three ratio um, so that a quarter of those receiving the Pfizer-BioNTech first jab should be randomized to receive the second uh, dose on schedule. Uh, my letter deliberately had a wide circulation list. I learned this from my late husband, who, whenever he wanted information to leak, ensured that a letter had a wide circulation list, and that almost guaranteed that it leaked, and so it did. And there was a Times article and editorial on the 18th of January, which uh, was rather useful. Jonathan Van Dam um, replied on the 21st of, of January, indicating that, uh, and, and there was a lot of behind the scenes work, not just by me, uh, by any means, um, uh, um, very much um, Jeremy Farrer and, and, uh, and also colleagues in Oxford, um, uh, indicating that they would indeed uh, proceed with an evaluation of uh, the delayed dosing interval and that would come out as an NIHR call. But of course, time was going on and, and major clinical trials units in, in the United Kingdom wanted to work collaboratively with the MRC and Wellcome to deliver this trial rather than competitively. And also, as time was going on, information from Israel about its uh, observational analysis of, of Pfizer-BioNTech and papers on immunogenicity warning that there could be peril from um, delaying that second uh, messenger RNA dose and also that um, a neutralizing antibodies decay at a faster rate in older recipients. In like a bit sooner would have been um, uh, to randomize without consent one third of those who were receiving the messenger RNA first dose between Burns Night and Valentine's Day uh, to have received their second dose on schedule, on the trial schedule, the original schedule of 122 days. And, and I would estimate that in those three weeks, uh, we might well have thereby randomized about 0.6 of a million. Uh, and then you would do record linkage follow-up, indeed to the end of 2021, because you do want to know not just about short-term outcomes, but specifically about vaccine effectiveness uh, by week since the first dose, in particular weeks five plus six, and then week seven to nine. And then um, uh, for the next six weeks, those receiving messenger RNA vaccine who would tend to be uh, less than 70 years of age, so younger individuals, um, we could uh, take consent before randomization, in other words, consent um, uh, at the first dose, and again, one third being randomized to receive the second dose on the original schedule. This requires an additional one third of doses only, uh, so it doesn't compromise to a great extent uh, the desire to maximize the number of individuals who receive a first dose. But it allows, importantly, it allows a check on exactly what is the pattern of vaccine effectiveness um, by 
during the period when a second dose would otherwise have been administered. And it is very difficult to do that evaluation without the randomization step because of the complex way in which incidence changes currently decreasing, we hope, but if we get another variant that comes into ascendancy, we might have increasing incidence again. And this happens in a, uh, 